Are you starting or shall I recap? Are you recap. Okay. Yes, start to recap. So last week we got up to the end of page 177 and uh, and it finished with a beautiful little paragraph which I'd quite like to read just to recap last week. The basic gist of this was that a person who's a Brahmin has no right to say that one is better because they're from a certain type of family but really the only division between human beings is not their caste, not their wealth, not their beauty, not their status, but their conduct. Mm. And these are the important things. So one is not better or worse by the external things, one is better or worse, if you like, by their virtue, their inner qualities. Mm. And then the Buddha says, I do not say that all are to be served, nor do I say that none are to be served. But if, when serving someone, one's faith, virtue, learning, generosity and wisdom increase in their service, then I say that they should be served. So this will become clear as we continue, but I'd like Venerable Upeka to continue. And uh, she's going to hopefully get to the end of this little bit and perhaps we can go further and start to talk about caste as well. So. This is all very interesting because you'll notice how far ahead of the game the Buddha was. Even today, we don't seem to be able to differentiate between a person's true worth from their mm. virtue other than, you know, as opposed to their outer presentation. And yet the Buddha was teaching this 2,600 years ago. So, would you like to start? <laughs> and as usual, for anyone who hasn't joined the Sutta discussions, it's not a sort of class, so we're not going to give you all the answers to this or ways to interpret it, but we want to see how it applies to your lives and how it might um, help and support you on your path. So mm. please feel free to stick up your virtual hand at any time and we'll come to you or write a question in the box and at a suitable time we'll pause and receive that input. Okay. So... The Brahmin Esukari next said to the Blessed One, Master Gautama, the Brahmins prescribe, prescribe four types of wealth. The wealth of a Brahmin, the wealth of a Katya, the wealth of a Vesa, and the wealth of a Suddha. Suddha. The Brahmins prescribe wandering for arms as the wealth of a Brahmin, a Brahmin who spurns wandering for arms abuses his duty like a guard who takes what not has not been given. They prescribe the bow and quiver as the wealth of a Katya. A Katya who spurns the bow and quiver abuses his duty like a guard who takes what has not been given. They prescribe agriculture and cattle breeding as the wealth of a Vesa, a Vesa who spurns farming and cattle breeding abuses his duty like a god who takes what has not been given. They prescribe the sickle and carrying pole as the wealth of a Suddha. A Suddha who spurns the sickle and carrying pole abuses his duty <clears throat> like a god who takes what has not been given. What does the Master Gautama say about this? Well, Brahmin, has all the world authorized the Brahmins to prescribe these four types of wealth? No, Master Gautama. Suppose, Brahmin, they were to force a cut of meat upon a poor, penniless, destitute man and tell him, Good man, you must eat this meat and pay for it too. So too, without the consent of those other ascetics and Brahmins, the Brahmins nevertheless prescribe these four types of wealth. Brahmin, I declare the noble supramundane Dhamma as a person's own wealth. 
but recollecting his ancient or her, ma- or, or her age there let's go around maternal or paternal lineage they are reckoned according to wherever they are born if they are born in a clan of katias they are reckoned as katias if they are born in a clan of brahmins they are reckoned as brahmins if they are born in a clan of vessas they are reckoned as vessas if they are born in a clan of suddhas they are reckoned as suddhas just as a fire is reckoned by a particular condition dependent on which it burns when fire burns dependent on logs it is reckoned as a log fire when fire burns dependent on faggots it is faggot is reckoned as a faggot fire when fire burns dependent on grass it is reckoned as a grass fire when fire burns dependent on cow dung it is reckoned as a cow dung fire so do brahmin so too brahmin i declare the supra noble supramundane dhamma as the person as a person's own wealth but recollecting his ancient maternal and paternal lineage he is reckoned according to wherever he is born so this seems a little bit unfair isn't it <laughs> i like how the buddha says here's a cut of meat eat it and pay for it too <laughs> it's like uh it's like um well here, there you are i'm going to declare you as only fit for uh carrying a was that sickle and carrying pole and <laughs> i said so and so good luck that's that's your suck it up suck it up <laughs> yeah. yeah um but that's you know today even in india you are defined by your caste it's amazing that you know thousands and thousands of years later that it has it is um what caste you are born to is the most defining i i, I don't know about the but quite often the most defining factor of what um where you are educated how you are treated by other fellow indians um what uh yeah who you what opportunities you have is to this day defined by where you were where your mm. caste at birth so it's terribly sticky and in our society as well you know we think we are we are beyond caste but we, like we uh I, i'm not sure about the uk australia is pretty good no <laughs> relatively it's quite racist yeah yeah i don't think it's very good if you think about the way the indigenous people absolutely treated, but that's it's... that's 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 just good that's just beyond comparison but that's yeah. a very fundamental part of australian culture mm. Mm. yeah so yeah it is in our societies and to recognize that we we uh how we uh define others and define ourselves sometimes by our wealth uh you know what school you went to um well i know which state you were born <laughs> uh just watching out for these tendencies in us and knowing that that is not our true wealth and where we how we do value ourselves is by this inherent uh uh a potential to see the dhamma isn't it that that is the quality that we all have within us that ability to see the dhamma and to and to um develop those qualities that lead to uh the the supramundane dhamma which is very high state but is our all our, our it is inside within us the potential so well anyway that's just a starting point but um what shall we talk about she has some questions for them yeah maybe yes how do you oh do no yes i i was that i had some questions 
I love it when we can ask you questions. <laughs> no, it's just that so often we, oh. What were you going to say? No, so often, so much of society, we are in pursuit of our status, our position in, uh, as in our wealth, our job, what we aspire to are also so much of these similar qualities, isn't it? But can we turn our minds away from that and, and uh, remember that it is those qualities of the Dhamma that makes us a valuable human being, qualities that the, of, of being virtuous, of um, yeah, being, you know, like a harmless person, that those are the qualities that <clears throat> make us a valuable human being. So to turn our minds away and to notice when we fall into the trap of prestige or status or um, wealth, you know. Yeah, I'm just thinking how tricky that is even in monastic life that, you know, I've seen often when um, monks especially, I mean, I just have to say that, um, have a lot of opportunities given to them, you know, by virtue of them going forth. Sometimes it can lead to this feeling that that is just their due, you know, or this must be due to some good karma of that person, uh, that they have such opportunities. And of course, the downside of that is if women have less opportunity, does that mean our karma is not so good? You know, how do we understand that? Or perhaps it's the opposite. And perhaps, you know, other people have created those conditions for, for all of us, right? Other people have often created the conditions, at least for monks to go forth. And actually, if we rest on our laurels and feel that that makes us in some way special or, you know, entitled, then we don't put forward the good comic actions and attitudes right now to make sure that we actually uh, make the best use of the opportunities that come, you know, and also we can lead into even disparaging other people, you know, and I think that's one of the problems with any kind of social inequity that if we don't see that other people don't have the same opportunities and um, basically opportunities and access to the Dhamma, for example, as we do, then we can start to think, oh, it's just that they're not interested. They don't have the, you know, the same kind of um, enthusiasm. They don't even have the same good karma. Whereas actually often the only difference between our capacity to awaken is the opportunities that we do or do not get. Um, so I think this is really important because yes, sure, anybody from any of those castes might have the opportunity, but if they're busy working on the farm to feed their family, you know, where, whilst other castes are, are quite well off and can have a life where they do pursue their spiritual aims, then, um, yeah, it's just a theory that everybody is the same. It's just a theory that everybody can, uh, um have opportunities to to realize the truth it's not about capacity but more about conditions um that's what i would like to say <laughs> yes that is also what i'm talking about tomorrow in a training for some dhamma leaders uh, but yeah there's a question in the chat and i don't know if you'd like to answer that what makes it super mundane dhamma What's the Buddha referring to by Super that? Super mundane Dhamma is the seeing the stream entry is super mundane. It's not just not just being a nice person, but it is breaking through to uh, yeah to to stream entry. That's what's meant by super mundane. Yeah, I wonder here what the actual word would be. Um, the noble super mundane Dhamma. I think he's actually talking about the Dhamma that leads to the super mundane state. So when it says noble super mundane, it's, it's the Dhamma that leads towards, um, yeah, stream winning, once returning, non returning, arahat. It's anything that leads in the direction of um, that which would cause the breakthrough to, the no to being a noble person, basically. Yeah. But I think this is actually describing the Dhamma in, in and of itself. And the Buddha's Dhamma is the Dhamma of awakening. So by its very nature, that is just a qualifier for the word Dhamma, really. I mm. think. Do you want to hear your book too? Because it's easier if we can both yeah. read in the book. 
Any other questions so far? Otherwise, we could actually um, get on to another one. Is there anything that pops up in anyone's mind? Or is that kind of clear on this super mundane Dhamma thing? I think it's like we say there's the noble eightfold path or there's the noble four noble truths. The truths in themselves are not noble. The path in itself is not noble, but by following it, it leads to noble mm -hmm. states. So it leads to a complete paradigm shift in the person who practices the Dhamma. Paradigm shift of view. Mm -hmm. Do you want to keep mm. reading the next I, one? I can, I can. Yeah. It's an interesting question, though. What is, is it? What exactly is meant by the noble supreme? Then, um, hmm. Is it that you have to have achieved it to? No, it's be, talking uh, about dhamma. As a person's own wealth, that you have to have real. You don't mm, have to. Have I declare it. the noble super mundane dhamma. Well, I think it's a process. It's referring to the process rather than the actual realization of the supermundane dhamma. Good, okay, we shall leave it as. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. For, yeah, is the realizing, the realizing or it is the realization or, or just the yeah. path leading to. Anyway. It's probably, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay. Shall we continue? Okay. Okay. So, caste is mere convention. Yeah. King Avantiputta of Madura asked the venerable Maha Kachana, Master Kachana, the Brahmins say thus, Brahmins are the highest caste. Those of any caste are inferior. Brahmins are the fairest caste. Hmm. Those of any caste are dark. Only Brahmins are purified, not non-Brahmins. Brahmins alone are the sons of Brahma, the offspring of Brahma, born of his mouth, Born of Brahma, created by Brahma, heirs of Brahma. What does the Mahakachana say about that? It is just a saying in the world, great king. And there is a way whereby it can be understood how that statement of the Brahmins is just a saying in the world. What do you think, great king? If a Katya prospers in wealth, will there be Katyas who rise before him and retire after him, who are eager to serve, who seek to please him and speak sweetly to him? And will there also be Brahmins, Vesas and Suddhas who do likewise? There will be, Master Kachana. What do you think, great king? If a Brahmin prospers in wealth, will there be Brahmins who rise before him and retire after him, who are eager to serve him, who seek to please him and speak sweetly to him? And will there also be Vesa, Suddhas and Katyas who do likewise? There will be Master Kachana. What do you think, great king, if a Vesa prospers in wealth, will there be Vesas who rise before him and after? and retire after him who are eager to serve him, who seek to please him and speak sweetly to him. And will there also be Suddhas, Katyas and Brahmins who do likewise? There will be Master Kachana. What do you think, great king? If a Suddha prospers in wealth, will there be Suddhas who will rise before him and retire after him, who are eager to serve him, who seek to please him and speak sweetly to him? And will there also be Katyas, Brahmins and Vesas who do likewise? There will be Master Kachana. What do you think, great king? If that is so, then are these four castes all the same or are they not? And how does it appear to you in this case? Surely if that is so, Master Kachana, then these four castes are all the same. 
There is no difference between them at all that I see. That is a way, great king, where it can be understood how that statement of the Brahmins is just a saying in the world. What do you think, great king? Suppose a Khatiya were to destroy life, take what is not given, engage in sexual misconduct, speak falsely, speak divisively, speak harshly, engage in sexual misconduct, speak falsely, speak divisively, speak harshly, gossip, be <coughs> covetous, have a mind of ill will and hold wrong view. On the dissolution of the body after death, would he be reborn in a state of misery, in a bad destination, in a lower world, in hell, or not? And how does it appear to you in this case? Oh. They would, he, he would be, maybe I started off with the Master Kacha. That is how it would, would, it would appear to me in this case. And thus, thus have I heard from the Arahants. Good, good, great king. What you think is good, great king, and what you have heard from the Arahants is good. What do you think, great king? Suppose the same of a Brahmin, a Vesa, a Suddha were to lack, act likewise. If a Brahmin, a Vesa, and a Suddha were such, Master Gautama, they would be born in a state of misery, in a bad destination, in a lower world, in hell. This is how it appears to me in this case. And thus have I heard from the Arahants. Okay, sure. Hmm. That's quite a lot, right? Is it interesting? Hmm. Any hmm. comments or questions or discussion around this? Go through a whole page. A whole page. Two pages. It's quite it's quite cute what the Buddha picks up on what people actually people that's Master your... Kachana. Huh? That's Master Kachana, not the Buddha. Hey, isn't that what the Buddha says? That, that if, he, if a Sudha prospers in wealth, wouldn't there be people who rise before him, eager to serve mm -hmm. him, seek to please him, and speak sweetly to him? Basically, if you're rich, <laughs> people do anything. <laughs> Is that there? Same then? It is now. Yeah. Mm. I have a friend who's worried about making new friends because she's uh, she thinks that people will be her friend for the money. And apparently mm. Robert Plant's daughter said that as well, because I have a friend who's Robert Plant's daughter's friend. <laughs> you all know how I like Plant's <laughs> friend. And, uh, and, and yeah, that's very difficult, actually, in some people's case, that they're not quite sure why people, you know, want to hang around with them. Sometimes it's for the wrong reasons. They're so superficial. <laughs> hmm. oh, yeah. Keep going. Okay. Okay. Good, good, great king. What do you think, great king? And what have you heard from what you have heard from the Arahants is good. What do you think, great king? If that is so, then are these four castes all the same or are they not? How does it appear to you in this case? Leo, <laughs> whatever caste you are, if you have done miserable things, <laughs> you still go to hell. Nobody's going to check your skin color. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and you can see that in yourself, isn't it? I mean, it's kind of an experiential truth because when we do do things that are unskillful and harm other people, we suffer right there and then. You know, nothing can help us out how we live and the wealth we have if we're just not happy. I always wonder, you know, with people who do terrible things, you know, some of the political leaders in the world, they might start off with good intentions in some cases, hopefully in most. But, you know, the kind of... Um, 
chaos and even wars that they create. I don't know if they can really go to bed at night with a clean conscience and feel very good about their lives. So, you know, even that you can consider a kind of hell, not being able to live with yourself, not feeling, yeah, feeling worried, feeling afraid that what's going to happen at the time of death. And I think sometimes people don't have to believe in hell or heaven, but, you know, that kind of terror when you come to the end of your life and you don't really understand what's going to happen to you or, you know, whether you've lived a good life. It must be very scary. And I think for people who know that they've, you know, lived the best way they can, then there's really not much to fear. Mm. I often feel that at the end of a day, you know, if I've done my best, mm. you can feel mm. satisfied with that. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Done your best, but I can't. Done good. Done good. Yeah. Done good. Done good. And the Buddha's always saying to bring up that goodness, you know, in your mind, because then you can experience the benefits of it right then and then. Mm. You know, it's not enough just to do good, but then we have to reflect on mm. it. I think that's where most of us forget. Yeah. We've it's not a practice doing. we've been taught, really. You know, we, we learn about mindfulness just being aware of what's arising, but we're very rarely aware of what's arising in an unbiased way. We're aware of it with the lens that we're wearing at the time. So if we're in a kind of irritable mood, we see everything through the eyes of irritation, nothing's good enough. Mm. And if we've had a bit of a sleep or if we've finished some nice work and, you know, feel more relieved, then we feel much softer, more friendly. Mm. <laughs> so mindfulness isn't really neutral. And the Buddha actually talked about the anusatis, which are a kind of mindfulness. It's like the mindfulness that goes along with a certain recollection. And he's asking us to use these in skillful ways to increase the wholesome states in our mind. So not only do we do good and live virtuous lives, but we also reflect on that, on how it feels. And uh, also on this idea of non-remorse, non-regret, you know. And it says in the suttas, it's in the um, Balapandita Sutta, somewhere in the Majjhima Nikaya towards the end. A really nice sutta, Balapandita. Bala means fool, Pandita means wise one. And there it says that the um, wise one at the end of the day reflects on all the goodness that they've done and they mm. think to themselves, I've done what is good, I've not done what's bad, you know, I've made myself a shelter from harm, a shelter from, uh, from suffering, I think it is, a refuge from suffering. And then they think about that and their goodness overspreads them like the shadow of um, a mountain when the sun goes down, it envelops them wherever they're sitting, then they feel all this happiness about their life. And I think it will be the same, you know, at the time of our death. We have to get into this mode even now and start reflecting in this way. So we have that pattern, mm -hmm. that habit of mind. Um, <coughs> because otherwise what will happen is that all the negative stuff will come back at you and you'll remember all your faults <laughs> and you might start to get worried and have regret and, and um, you know, whatever we reflect upon frequently becomes what's in the forefront of our mind. So it's really important to kind of uh, not only do good, but value doing good and, and remember doing good and encourage yourself and really enjoying the results of wholesome actions, not in an egotistical way, but just because it feels good to be kind. It's something very intrinsic to a human being, isn't it? We kind of know when we do something not quite nice. Even if you've been grumpy, like I've been a bit grumpy when I'm tired and on my period and all that, I can get a bit grumpy. I mean, not angry with people, but just a bit like, mm. and uh, afterwards I feel bad because I know that, you know, I won't feel like that when the mood changes. <laughs> Luckily in a monastery, people are quite kind and understanding and there's room for a little bit of grumpiness. But uh, yeah, it's nice to... Uh, Keep things in perspective. Mm. I like what Manori does. Yeah. Being an accountant. Oh, yeah. She has a I spreadsheet of the all, you know, all the five precepts and all the other things. Five that, hindrances. Five, five hindrances. Yeah, a yeah. whole bunch of qualities. And she ticks it off every day. <laughs> <laughs> what she has done and what she what she what she hasn't done and she has a little I don't know she's an accountant checklist checklist <laughs> <at the end laughs> of the day. little spreadsheet 
As long as you don't judge yourself too much, it's probably a good thing. You give yourself marks out of 10. <laughs> it's, it's good because you don't yeah. think, you know, heck, I didn't kill anybody today. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Chalk it up. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Anyway, yeah. we're talking a lot, aren't we? Okay. It's, it's nice because we talk together. <laughs> but I just want to be sure that no one's... Oh, good. Someone has went to the house. Okay. Give people a chance. All right. Madeline, we are. Um, yes. Yeah, I'm just going to um, say that in the Catholic tradition, there's this wonderful thing of examination of conscience ah. at the end of every day. And um, I, I would really like to find um, the equivalent to that in in the, in the suttas or in, in any of the Buddhist texts. Oh. So what you were mentioning seems to be like an examination of conscience. So if you could just maybe give us the the reference for that, mm. I'd be I'd really like that very much. Be, I mean, I do do at the end of every day. I I run through how I've been. Have I any greed, hatred, or delusion there, or anything like that? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there'll be no delusion there for sure. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I know um, what you mean. Uh, yeah, so you know, have I been kind and have I been practicing yeah. metta to the best of my ability and so on? Yeah. So I do do this, but if there is, is a, if there's a sutta that re relates to yeah. that, that yeah. would be that would be very nice to have. Right, right. Thank you. Um, I don't know if there's a sutta that goes to it in that extent, but there it's are some things. Cities. Yeah, these are called Anusatis. Um, the one that I... The one that... Oh, yeah. Mahanama Sutta? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. someone's saying the Mahanama Sutta. Could some nice kind co-host write this in? And um, also the Bala Pandita Sutta that I mentioned is the one that I was referencing now. Um, I would also say the one on effacement. It's not exactly that, but it's kind of like making an aspiration or determination not to be the way others are. So it's says things like, um, others will be miserly. I will, we will not be miserly here. Others will be hateful. We will not be hateful here. Others will, you know, be jealous or whatever. We will not be jealous here. So it goes through it like that, but that's more of an aspiration and it's more of a, a sort of programming of the mind. I don't think the Buddha's ever actually recognized it, advising us to recollect on the things we've done wrong that's the interesting thing about buddhist psychology he doesn't say that we should do asilanusati he only says that we should do silanusati the virtue that we have actually practiced and the other thing about you know looking at greed hatred and delusion is that because of delusion it's precisely because of delusion that we can't see delusion if we knew we were deluded, we wouldn't be deluded. <laughs> or we could say that we're undeluded to the extent that we know we're deluded, right? So we can't actually know if we're deluded. We can probably know that we are. And the greed and hate as well. I mean, sure, it's good to notice when that's strong. But I think going over it has the possibility of becoming a little bit um, too fault-finding. And it's been shown in sort of psychological studies that actually by going over our faults, it tends to lead to more unwholesome states. It tends to lead to feelings of um, guilt or shame, which is different from remorse and regret. Remorse and regret is like acknowledge your mistake and make a determination not to repeat it, but then move on to something positive, you know, also acknowledge the good. Don't kind of dwell in regret or like shame or anything like this. Um, so I think when the Buddha talks about things like um, hiri and otapa, which I like to translate as moral conscience and moral caution rather than fear and shame, um, it's more of a preventative measure than a kind of reprimand. So as far as I understand it, most of the time the Buddha is telling us to reflect on our goodness and our generosity and our sila, and reflect on things like the devas, reflect on the Buddha Dhamma Sangha, these are the Anusatis, and also Marana Anusati, reflecting on death. So these kind of things automatically reduce the possibility of unwholesome states arising. And I think that's the skillful place to put our energy. Yeah, thanks for finding some of those suttas. Mm. Yeah, I think otherwise it can be a bit like self-flagellation, you know. <laughs> I remember seeing a nun once, I won't say who it was, but one of the nuns in Perth, she'd written out this 
pieces of paper and I was quite shocked actually when I saw it it said things like I will um I don't know like what's a really bad word this word in amazing grace wretch I really don't like that song because it says that saved a wretch like me I mean it's awful to call yourself a wretch and she'd written something similar like I will not be a wretch I will not be a wretch again and again and again it wasn't that exact word but it was something like that and I just thought oh this feels so bad actually even to read that it just feels so you know so kind of berating and harsh so that's not the way that i've learned the buddha dhamma i think the buddha wants us to be kind to be forgiving to be understanding with ourselves and also with other people yeah but acknowledge our mistakes what do other people think about that be interested Any, any, any? Here. All right. Oh, two again. people. Excellent. Benjamin. I will come back to you again, Madeline, if you um, have more to say on that. Hi, Benjamin. Hello. Uh, yes, just to comment on what Madeline was saying, actually. Um, I hadn't heard about this examination of conscience, was it? Um, but uh, it just struck me that very famously in the Kalama Sutta, the Buddha says, you know, let your teachers remain your teachers, let your practices remain your practices. So if the examination of conscience is useful to you, just do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm. that's a good point too. Mm. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. Mm. I mean, I'm speaking from the perspective of what I've found in the Buddha's teachings and that I'm not sure it's exactly the same, but I think that's right. I mean, mm. if something's helpful mm. and sometimes you can't tell straight away, it's kind of, is it helpful over a long period of time? Is it actually kind of helping you to um, live a happier life and a more beautiful mm. life? And if it is, then go for it. You know, if the wholesome states are increasing mm. generally, because sometimes we kind of, they increase a bit, they go down a bit, and then we might think, oh, it's not working. But if you have to keep going with it for a while to see if it's gradually on the up, you know. Yeah. Madeline, have you more to add? Oh, just a tiny thing. I was just going to say, I don't really castigate myself or anything like right. that. I may have given the impression that I do, but I check that I have lived as as well as I possibly can within the precepts yeah. and um, feel if if I have um, then I feel I feel contented and yeah and That's great. I've, um, I've I've done I've progressed along the path is what I think but mm. the, the, so this reflect it's re, it's a reflective kind of process that doesn't necessarily have to be negative it yeah. can be positive as well yeah, and, uh, yeah. It, it does help one to reflect mm. on, on your sila. Yeah. Mm. Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that it's such a well formulated practice in uh, that I haven't heard of actually. Mm. Is that um, in the, which kind of Christian religion, or is it Catholicism, or it's Catholicism, and it's right. well known in Catholicism. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Oh. Yeah. Oh, thanks so for nice. sharing. Yeah. Thanks. And um, someone's saying, I think the Christian I'm a wretch attitude comes from the idea of original sin, which is not a Buddhist concept. Yeah, and it's interesting, someone was talking about that recently. I don't know if they asked it as a question, but they're asking this idea. I think it was at Gaia House on the retreat about, you know, are we basically bad or, or what are we? Maybe it was in America, actually, because there were people there that... Um, actually talked about religious trauma. I've never ever seen that on an application form in any other country, but there were two people with religious trauma on the form. Oh, no. Yeah. And uh, I think it's a completely different paradigm because I don't think we believe that there is a permanent self. So there can't be a person who's either bad or good. Mm. It's a process. So I think that is the difference. You know, there can be wholesome qualities, there can be unwholesome qualities, and the way that's defined is usually that they lead to suffering or they lead out of suffering into peace mm -hmm. and happiness. And, you know, for oneself and others, right? It's not only one's own happiness, but it should be the kind of happiness that can be shared and that can alleviate the suffering of others too. So I think that is the big difference. You know, we don't see ourselves as bad or good. We see ourselves, or 
the this thing that we take to be a self as um deluded <laughs> you know we understand that we don't understand quite how things really are um but we try to develop wholesome qualities and that is a process it's a practice so Amazing. yeah i think wholesome and unwholesome is so different from bad and good yeah and delusion is very different from bad delusion yeah. just simply means you don't see you don't you don't yeah you don't okay. see what is the truth right and, and you suffer as a result and you suffer as a result but you also <coughs> yeah. do a lot of unwholesome things <coughs> through delusion and mm -hmm. that is quite reassuring to me because mm -hmm. It's only through delusion that you do those unwholesome things. I kind of genuinely believe that people don't mean to do unwholesome things. Mm -hmm. Quite often they think they're doing something that's to us perhaps obviously, you know, violent, for example, but they actually believe they're doing it for the good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is delusion. So delusion has consequences. I mean, it's not a neutral thing. It's actually the root of all the, um, of greed and hate. So we don't see things the way they are, and that's why we generate greed and hate. If we saw them as impermanent, suffering and non-self, then there'd be no reason to generate greed and hate. But because we don't see things as they are. That's why when we do see things as they are, our conduct changes. <laughs> we become more able to live with kindness and in peace. Yeah, should we keep going? We're actually getting through quite a bit of sutta today. No, oh, so Sean was asking, is Maha Kachana, it's actually Master Kachana the Buddha, but no, it's another monk. Kachana, oh, that's sorry. what I was trying to say. Oh, sorry. Yes, yes, sorry, it's, sorry, this sorry. is yeah, a teaching from um, Kachana. Yeah. Oh. Maha Kachana. Right. It's not Maha, I think it is Maha Kachana, but here it says Master Kachana. He's one of the monks who was expert in... Um, uh, was it the he, one who was explaining, explaining the Dhamma? Yeah, yeah. elucidating yeah. short passages, I think. Yeah, and there's another one. Was that Master Kotita? There's another one that's expert mm. in bringing out short passages. Oh. Anyway, it's one or the other, but he was one of the great debaters. So the Venerable Sari put a love to talk to him as well. And he was often, yeah, given the task of explaining things in detail. Mm. So these are all Arahat disciples. So, you know, it's pretty good. Mm. <laughs> the Buddha would have approved. Yeah. Do you want to keep reading, yeah. or shall I? Yeah, you read. Yeah, it's up to you. Yes. No, you you, you read a bit. <clears throat> okay. Good, good, great king. Oh, Sean has. A <clears throat> oh, Sean has a question. Okay. <laughs> okay. Come to Sean. Hello. Can you hear me? Hi, Sean. Hello. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I was just thinking when you were talking about this about being deluded, it just made me think, I actually heard someone speaking, someone who used to be in the CIA, and how, they, how they managed to, you know, get people on their side to become, you know, gather information. And how he related it was the, is, is what do you say, perception and perspective, and basically saying, the you know the majority of people whatever it is 90 whatever percent of people see everything from their own perspective and basically i think it relates to the teachings and that they're, they're deluded and they don't realize that actually if they take themselves out of their perspective and see it outside of that how it just completely changes your life I mean, in what he was talking about, obviously they kind of manipulate people. So it's not very nice, a lot of it, but it made me think it, that it's all kind of interrelated though, when you understand the psychology, which is kind of partly what this is. Uh, and I've heard it elsewhere as well. And it means then that you, it's much easier to take things less personally. So if you realize, wow, actually, if I was that person had their life, you know, and then you talk about karma, Actually, if I can really put myself in, they don't know what they're doing. They're doing it because yeah. they're deluded. And and I just find that often when you talk about these psychological things, they, they all cross over, like you were saying with um, Catholicism as well. 
that that a lot of these things actually are interrelated. Um, but yeah, I just thought it was really interesting, just resonated with me that piece that they've used it. They know, you know, in 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 the CIA that kind of way of thinking, and and it works. So it's just a, another, yeah, hmm. information really. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean, I can't remember that exact comment, but I think actually I would say everyone's deluded. I mean, unless you're a stream winner, mm. then we're deluded and we only see things through our eyes. Mm. We only see things, we only can see things according to our conditioning and <laughs> the way we've been trained to see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Are you able yeah, to? Yeah, I think my he's throat right. is actually quite tired. Okay. No, I bit that bit. Okay. Good, good Greek king. What do you, what do you think is good Greek king? And what you have heard from the other hearts is good. What do you think Greek king? If that is so, then are these four casts all the same? Or are they not? How does it appear to you in this case? Surely, if that is so, Master Kachana, then these four castes are all the same. There is no difference between them and all, at all that I see, at all that I see. That is also a way, great king, whereby it can be understood how the statement of the Brahmins is just a saying in the world. What do you think, great king? Suppose a Katya were to abstain from the destruction of life, from taking what is not given, from sexual misconduct, from false speech, from divisive speech, from harsh speech, and from gossip, and were to be uncovetous, to have a benevolent mind and to hold right view on the dissolution of the body after death, would he be, be reborn in a good destination, in a heavenly world or not? And how does it appear to you in this case? He would be Master Kachana. That is how it appears to me in this case. And thus have I heard from the Arahants. Good, good, great king. What do you think is good, great king? And what you had heard from the Arahants is good. What do you think, great king? Suppose a Brahmin, a Ves, a Suddha were to abstain from the destruction of life, from the taking of what is not given, from sexual misconduct, from false speech, from divisive speech, from harsh speech, from gossip, and were to be uncovetous, to have a benevolent mind, to hold right view. On the dissolution of the body after death, would he be reborn in a oh, good shape? She be reborn in a good destination, in a heavenly world or not? And how does it appear to you in this case? They would be, Master Kachana. That is how it appears to me in this case. And thus have I heard from the Arahants. Good, good, great king. What you think is good, great king. And what you have heard from the Arahants is good. What do you think, great king? If that is so, then are these four castes all the same or are they not? Or how does it appear to you in this case? Surely if that is so, Master Kachana, then these four castes are all the same. There is no difference between them at all that I see. That is also a way, great king, whereby it can be understood how that statements of the Brahmins is just a saying in the world. What do you think, great king? Suppose a Katya were to break into houses, plunder wealth, commit burglary, 
ambush highways or seduce another's wife or husband our husband and if you if your men arrested him and produced him saying sire this is the culprit command what punishment for him you wish or her how would you treat him or her he would have him or her executed master kachana or we would have them fined or we would have them exiled or we would have them as they deserve why is this because he has lost his former status of a katya and is simply reckoned as a robber what do you think great king suppose a brahmin a ves a sudha were to do the same and if your men arrested her or him and produced her and produced her saying sire this is the culprit command what punishment for her you wish how would you treat her we would have her executed master kachana i would have her fined or we would have her exiled i would have do with her as 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 she deserves why is that because she has lost her former status of a brahmin of vesar so that is simply reckoned as a robber what do you think great king if that is so then are these four castes all the same or are they not and how does it appear to you in this case surely that is so master kachana then all these cast four castes are all the same there is no difference between them at all that i see that is also a way great king whereby it can be understood that the statements of the brahmin is just a saying in the world suppose what do you think great king suppose a katya having shaved off their hair and beard put on the ochre robe and gone forth from the home life into homelessness were to abstain from the destruction of life from taking what is not given from false speech refraining from eating at night he would eat only in one part of the day and would be celibate virtuous of good character how would you treat him her uh, we would pay homage to them master kachana or we would rise up for them or invite them to be seated or we would in, invite them to accept robes arms food lodgings and medicinal requisites or we would arrange for their lawful guarding defense and protection why is that because they have lost their former status of a katya and is simply reckoned as an ascetic what do you think great king suppose a brahmin a vesa and a sudha were to do the same thing how would you treat them we would pay homage to them master kachana or rise up for them or invite them to be seated or we would invite them to accept robes arms food lodgings and medicinal requisites and uh, we would arrange for their lawful guarding defense and protection why is that because they have lost the former status of a brahmin vesa or sudha and is simply reckon, reckoned as an ascetic what do you think great king if that is so then all these four castes are the same or are they not or how does it appear to you in this case surely if that is so master kachana then all these four castes are all the same there is no difference between them at all that i see that is also a way great king whereby it can be understood how that statement of the brahmins is just a saying in the world sad 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 it's interesting isn't it that um the sangha joining the sangha wearing the okra robe and mm. shaving one's head and beard even if one doesn't have a beard but <laughs> anyway you can pluck the hairs from your chin <laughs> if you're a middle-aged lady <laughs> um it's interesting that that abolishes caste we lose our former status it's irrelevant mm. whether we were rich poor what color skin mm. we have whether we were from a lower caste a higher caste all that is supposed to vanish and it's always interesting to me that some people i mean i don't want to 
necessarily criticise this, but I do find it a bit strange that some monastics, they still call themselves doctor such and such, even if they've like, you know, become ordained, they will keep part of the identity of what they did before somehow. And I mean, of course, the same kind of conceit and pride and all the rest can manifest in monastic mm -hmm. life. It's not that everybody instantly becomes humble and stops looking down on others, but it doesn't have any validation to do so. There's no, um, there's no actual um, ground for doing that. And I think this is one of the suttas that, I think it's the Vesata Sutta, isn't it? Or is that the next one? Majjhima number 84, maybe someone can figure that out. But I think it's one of the suttas that, um, you know, the um, Ambedkar Buddhists in India use to convert to Buddhism because they were from like this so-called untouchable caste, which was later renamed as Harijan, I think, by Mahatma Gandhi, wasn't it? Mm. The children of God or something. But that was rejected too later on because mm. that sounds a little bit patronizing. But basically this is still taken literally in India that somebody from that lowest of low castes, according to their own designation, the Brahmins probably, um, is actually not fit to be touched. So people won't invite them into their house, they won't eat from the same plate, they won't let them use the same water source, etc. And to um, overcome that absolutely terrible lack of human treatment, basically, um, many people gained faith in the Buddha's teachings and converted to Buddhism, I think precisely for this reason. So the Buddha was actually in his way, abolishing caste, you know, the Sangha was mm -hmm. a place where it didn't matter whether you were rich, poor, black, white, paler, darker, it didn't matter whether you were male or female, the ordination platform was exactly the same, the actual um, monastic life was exactly the same. Some people say, well, you know, but the Vinaya for the monks is a bit different from the Vinaya for the monk nuns. But in the beginning, I mean, the precepts were enough, you know, the basic precepts were the kind of hallmark of monastic life, plus the celibacy and the not handling of money. Um, and, you know, other monastic conventions like not eating afternoon. But actually, the uh, subsequent precepts just came about as a response to particular things that happened at that time. So the only reason it's different is not because one not a male and one not a female, but just because it, it came around through the behavior of people at that time. So the monastic life opportunities were also equal. Everything was equal in the Buddha's day. And that was 2,600 years ago. Isn't that wonderful? So he was a social activist, you could say. He was, a, I don't know, could you say he's a communist? Socialist, certainly. Humanist, right? Humanitarian. Um, person who basically saw that every human being has the same potential for enlightenment provided they're given the conditions so the buddha was rebellious that you can definitely say he was radical he was going against social convention and actually while i'm on that <laughs> that also disputes this idea that the buddha um it's one of the ways you could dispute the idea that the buddha just added the idea of rebirth to keep in with the times because in the times not everybody believed in that either but the buddha certainly never laid down anything in order to keep in conformity with the times <laughs> he was uh yeah well ahead of his times and a free thinker who who created opportunities for all with little dust in their eyes so yeah very beautiful so yeah i guess even <laughs> in the buddha's day you would have had brahmins who would rise up for people from lower castes who they may have once despised but now that they were uh, ordained they would recognize that above their former caste i don't know if that's still the case today i hope so but uh what a wonderful world that would be so i think that's quite a lot of sutta today but it's all one sutta mm. so it would be lovely to hear any comments or questions or considerations around this. Maybe the idea of caste and race is a little bit, I don't know, sensitive in some way. I don't know. Um, but how does that feel to hear that? It also applied to age, you know, in the Sangha. Um, 
I mean, just because you're older, you wouldn't get more respect. Just because you were younger, you wouldn't be disrespected. It all depended on um, how long it was since you went forth. So the senior was not the senior by age anymore, but by time in robes. And that's the same today as well. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts? Last thoughts? Anyone? Mm -hmm. Anything? Well, no, it seems caste seems to be irrelevant in, in the Buddha's dispensation. No, no, in, in this day, it seems like, you know, caste, but we still do discriminate people. Oh, completely. By, by, um, yeah. The problem with it is that it's unconscious. <laughs> mm. You know, if we knew we were doing it, then I guess we'd stop. Mm. It's lo lovely to be yeah. the logical and coherent way that the argument against cast yes, against cast is put in the yes, sutta. Yes, yeah. yes, teaching by counter questioning, mm. a very skillful, effective mm. way, because then the person comes to their own understanding of why. <laughs> mm. yeah. yeah, logical and coherent. Mm. Very much so. Mm -hmm. Very good. So if there's nothing, then I think we're not going to start another sutta in the last five minutes. So we can close the session soon. So I take over then to thank you, Venerable, Venerable Chanda, and also Venerable Upeka for these rich teachings and for giving us opportunity to discuss, question, and understand the teachings deeply. So, as you know, today's dis Sutta discussion was offered on the basis of donations and uh, in the spirit of generosity. And this is an opportunity for us to practice generosity in any way we can afford and uh, in whatever way we can. The generosity is developed to give us, give our mind joy and energy. And so we can carry it on to our meditation and develop our practice. So with your generosity, what does Anukampa Bhikkhuni project do? It uh, can provide the community and the wide world with valuable Dhamma talks, teachings and meditation retreats. You know, we have the YouTube channel and all the old talks are there. All the different retreat talks, all are there. Um, and if you like to support the new monastery and the Sangha's requisite, mm -hmm. you are invited to donate by using the link below. Mm -hmm. And if you can do standing orders, that's much appreciated. Uh, because the new monastery is not in a, a very easily, you know, it, not in a location that e e people can easily go to a supermarket to buy things. So it has to be properly arranged. So the main need these days is getting food and other requisites, the new monastery. You can arrange a food dana or a supermarket delivery, even if you are far away, you can arrange it remotely. Uh, please contact team at anukampaproject.org if you would like to get involved. And there's a list of needed items as well in the, um, in the website. Um, it's called uh, needed items. I'll just put the link. So because whenever there's um, there's something urgent, they'll they'll update the link. So it is a nice way that you know exactly your item is properly needed. Um, and also, um, please look at the website for the events. There are some nice upcoming, very exciting upcoming events coming. Uh, Venerable Chanda is teaching at the Gaia House, and then Venerable Brahmali is coming. Uh, Venerable Chanda and Venerable Brahm is doing, Venerable Chanda and Ajahn Brahm is doing, uh, I didn't want Venerable Brahm is okay. <laughs> I didn't want on him. That's okay. No, it's not demotion, it's the same. There's an online retreat as well, so there's 
so many events. <laughs> we update it um, and uh, have a look on and off. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Minori. Yes, there's still plenty of opportunities to join Asia Pramali's talks. Um, that's in June. But before then, there's also, uh, I'm teaching in Oxford on Monday night, as I think I mentioned. So for anyone who is more or less local, you can come to the Peace House. I think it's on the um, Oxford Insight website, Oxford Insight Monday evenings or something. And then in May, I'm doing a day retreat in Oxford on the 11th and a day retreat in Bristol on the 18th of May. So anyway, it's all on the Anacampo events page and still place on Ajahn Brown's retreat. By the way, Ajahn and Venerable are not higher or lower. It's just that Ajahn is given after 10 years. Venerable, most monks, well, not most, but many, choose to stay with Venerable. Bante means Venerable, Aya means Venerable. So um, many reject that title. Ajahn, actually, many of the people I know, like Bhikkhu Bodhi or Bhante Analeo, Bhante Sajato, because Ajahn is actually like a title. Although it sounds as though venerable is a title, it's the opposite. Venerable is universal to all monastics. Ajahn is something you get after 10 years. So it's a bit like, now oh, I'm 10 years, I've got this kind of, but it just means teacher. So anyone can be a teacher, whether you're 50 years or whether you're, I don't know, any amount of years. Um, but it's become in the Thai tradition anyway, a kind of uh, a kind of word people take at that time. So yeah. Very good. Thank you all for your interest in the suttas. I was thinking it's kind of amazing because there's so much on the internet these days. There's so much on YouTube, but you choose to be here, you know, and hear these suttas, which are not immediately entertaining, perhaps, or obvious, or, you know, even inviting necessarily. But when you start to kind of really look at them in some detail, they're very, very rich. So I find it wonderful that you're all. Um, so interested and hopefully we'll see you next week so please take care everybody and uh yeah tomorrow the meta session is cancelled not because i'm unwell or something some people will oh no but it's just because i'm doing some training for some anyway sort of teachers dumber teachers kind of anyway it's something i haven't done before and uh, i have 50 people and I have to cover the Four Noble Truths and Anatta and Identity and Women's Ordination in two hours, <laughs> including lots and lots of discussion and uh, discussion groups. So it's quite an ask. But uh, anyway, I'm giving that a go. So I think the Meta Meditation will be next Saturday. Is that right? Following Saturday. All right. Take care. And we can unmute you and uh, wave goodbye. <laughs>